You know that old philosophical question, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? If you work in advertising, you know the answer is a hard no. It makes no sound at all because it never happened. Even if it happened, it never happened. This is the mindset of the advertising professional. There are products falling in the woods, so to speak, all the time. The culture never stops. But our job is to make sure people notice. Not just notice, but get so excited about a product that you won't stop until you have it in your hands. I bring this up because when you think of it, really good marketers, really good advertisers are and have always been the behind the scenes magicians that power our culture's most progressive leaps forward. Now that may sound like a big statement and certainly a self-serving statement, but for every significant inventor, scientist, musician, artist, what have you, there was a communications whiz who made sure that that critical, amazing new thing didn't die unnoticed in the woods. A creator may give a thing birth, but the marketer gives it life. The story I'm about to tell is one of abject failure. It's the story of a product that metaphorically fell in the woods not once, but twice, yet nobody heard it. It should have died out there, pushed aside for the next thing. But the hero product of this story was kept on life support for 10 years through three incarnations and eventually, against all odds, became not just one of the biggest selling brands in history, but one that launched an entire new product category. This is a product that went from total obscurity to a household name through a lot of luck and one legendary advertising campaign. The year is 1964. A chemist named Dr. Hirsch Gablinger in Basel, Switzerland was tinkering with a new way to brew beer. I won't get into the chemistry here because I don't really understand it myself, but it's a process where the yeast would digest the starch resulting in a beer that had fewer calories and no residual carbohydrates. This had never been achieved before in brewing, and after years of trial and error, old Hirsch cracked it. Now, across the pond in Brooklyn, New York, the Rheingold Brewing Company heard about this new invention and sent a team to Switzerland to check it out. They taste the beer and it's awful. But excited by the promise of a first of its kind product, a diet beer product, Rheingold bought the exclusive rights to use Gablinger's process. They take it home to Brooklyn and they start working on the recipe, tinkering with it, trying to get it to taste better, to give it a richer, more of a Pilsner taste. It takes them months and months, but they too, after a lot of trial and error, crack the code. And in 1966, the very same year the Beatles blew everyone's minds with their masterpiece album Revolver, the Rheingold Brewing Company rolled out the biggest innovation in beer since the Brown Bottle, a product they called... Gablinger's Diet Beer. And it flopped. Over the next few years, the patent on the recipe changed hands a few times. I will spare you the boring business details. But Meister Brow Brewing, the eventual owner, decides to relaunch the product as Meister Brow Light. Unfortunately, the second try was no more successful than the first. Big flop. Fast forward to 1972. After the failure of Meister Brow Light and several other business gaffes, Meister Brow Brewing was facing big financial issues. So they decided to sell several of their labels to growing competitors. <laughs> By the way, Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, always a great idea when your company is in trouble to start selling off its most valuable assets. Key to success every time. So they sell the label to Miller Brewing in Milwaukee. Now the Miller executives found themselves intrigued by this novelty product, this quote unquote diet beer, but they had concerns. After all, at this point, it's a twice failed product. If they were going to turn lemons into lemonade, they needed to take a different approach. And they did in two specific ways. First, they decide to rebrand it under the simple name Light, 
L-I-T-E, an alternate spelling of L-I-G-H-T. This seems like nothing now, but at the time in the early 1970s, that weird spelling really stood out in the American marketplace. It was an attention grabber. The word light would appear on the label with the Miller logo beneath it. Simple, elegant. Second, they needed a really good marketing plan. Again, this product had already failed twice under two different labels, but it had been marketed only one way, as a low-calorie diet beer targeted to overweight men and to women trying to watch their figures. So Miller Brewing made the bold move of not just marketing this product differently, but targeting a new audience entirely. They decided to market the beer to upwardly mobile men aged 30 and up. And instead of emphasizing the, let's call them effeminate qualities of weight loss and health consciousness, they positioned it instead as a man's beer, all caps. Red-blooded, heterosexual, blah, 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 you get it. This is the 1970s, so let's remember the context. And here was their hook. Because Miller Lite is lower calorie, you can drink more of it. And it tastes just as good as the full calorie beers you're used to, so there's nothing lost in the experience. This strategy, simple as it seems, gave way to one of the greatest advertising campaigns of all time. One and all, my name is Greg Ippolito. Welcome to the first episode of our limited series, The Greatest Advertising Campaigns of All Time, where we will feature, in no particular order, the greatest advertising campaigns of all time, uh, which should be evident from the title. And today we are talking about one of my favorites, Light Beer from Miller's iconic, taste great, less filling campaign. Now, if you're a Gen Xer or a boomer, you know this campaign intimately. These spots ran nonstop from around 1975 through the late 80s across just about every important sporting event that ever aired. If you watched a football game on any given Sunday in the 70s or 80s, the Miller Lite spots were all over there. They live in your memory as much as any play that happened on the field. So now, here's how a typical light beer from Miller commercial would go in case you don't know. A well-known athlete walks into a bar, let's say legendary Chicago Bears linebacker Dick Buckus, who, trust me, was a big deal back then. And he says that when he's hanging out with the guys, he prefers light beer from Miller. Why? Because it only has one-third the calories of his regular beer, so it's less filling. Then another famous athlete comes into the frame, let's say legendary Baltimore Colts defensive end Bubba Smith. And yes, for you youngins, the Colts were originally from Baltimore. And Bubba says that he prefers light beer from Miller because it tastes great. Then Bucca shouts back, less filling. Then Bubba shouts back, tastes great, less filling. Tastes great, less filling. And in the end, the spot would always dovetail into the iconic tagline. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. This was the template And there were literally hundreds of different versions. They were always set at some place where guys are hanging out and being guys. A bar, a barbecue, a tailgate, a golf course, yada yada. And they all featured likable guys we all recognized. Guys like Buckus, Bubba, John Madden, Red Auerbach, Yogi Berra, you name it. Who were good-natured and self-effacing enough to be filmed having an ongoing ridiculous argument about whether the best thing about Miller Lite was that it tasted great or was less filling. This may have been the first campaign that was talked about like a great sitcom. I remember hearing my dad and his friends talking about these ads, laughing about them, and repeating the line, did you see the one where, as in, did you see the one where Bubba Smith rips the top off the can? Did you see the one where Joe Frazier sings? Did you see the one where Steinbrenner fires Billy Martin again? It was a campaign that got people talking. It reached what Malcolm Gladwell called the tipping point, or what modern marketers call going viral. It's the point where media spend stops doing all the heavy lifting of delivering a brand's message, and the audience starts doing it for you. So why did this campaign work? Well, two main reasons. The first reason 
it tapped into the two best things about the product. One, that it was less filling, not low cal or diet, mind you, because what do red-blooded American guys care about that? No, less filling means you can drink more of it, which means you can hang out all day. Two, that it tasted great, because hey, less filling is an important differentiator, but if it doesn't taste and feel like real beer, then no one's going to want it. Real guys want real beer, and there's no shortcutting that. The second reason, this campaign tapped into something that had been completely missing from beer marketing, that drinking is a group activity. If you look at any other beer campaign of the time, it typically centered on some product feature, a unique brewing process or an easy to drink bottle or something like that. But these are messages about one's personal sensory experience with a beer. What Miller Lite understood is that drinking isn't typically a personal experience. It's something you do with your friends. It's what you do when you're hanging out with the guys, shooting pool, throwing darts, cracking jokes, complaining about your wives, etc. Years later, a, t- a little TV show called Cheers would use this premise to become one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time. All right, let's pause for a moment for a brief lesson in advertising. For those listeners not in the biz, building a powerful brand requires certain steps. First, you need to establish a strong position in the marketplace. By position, I mean where you stand among your competitors and where you stand in the minds of your main audiences. To create a brand with a strong position, you need to determine three key things about your brand. One, what makes it different. Two, what makes it compelling. Three, what makes it credible. Different, compelling, credible. These are the three basic legs of the stool. Take away any one of them and your brand doesn't hold up. Imagine, for example, that your brand is different and compelling, but not credible. Your messages won't land because no one will trust you. Or imagine you have a brand that's compelling and credible, but it's no different than other products in the marketplace. There's no reason to choose your product over something else, etc., etc. You can run this thought experiment any number of ways. So those are the three elements of any good brand. But if you want to create a great brand, you need a fourth element. And that element is rare. It's the stuff of legendary brands. The best of the best. Brands that have become icons of American culture. And that fourth element is this, that your audience sees its best reflection in your message. Light beer from Miller nailed all four. It was different in that it was a light beer, which was new at the time. It was compelling because despite it being light, it tasted great. And it was credible because in every commercial, you watched your sports heroes enjoying it with all their friends. Finally, the audience saw its best reflection in these ads because they saw that Miller Lite is the beer for hanging out with the guys, watching sports, cracking jokes, having a great old time. These commercials gave you a portal into a world you wanted to live in. These guys felt like guys you know. They felt like your friends. And you wanted to be in that bar or at that tailgate or at that bowling alley or whatever, enjoying a Miller Lite and hanging out with the guys. That's what made this campaign transcendent, that fourth element. Because if the subtext of this campaign was hanging out with the guys, the sub-subtext was away from the wife and kids, away from your job, away from all the stuff that drags you down. This was the first beer campaign that wasn't really about the beer. The beer was just a means to an end. And that end was a better version of you, or at least a happier version of you. Now, I'd be remiss not to take a moment to address the obvious sexism weaved into the fabric of this campaign, so let's do it. First off, in the first five years of the campaign, you scarcely saw a woman on camera. Spot after spot after spot, it was dudes. And even when women were eventually introduced on camera, it was usually to play the role of the ditzy blonde with heaving cleavage. There's a strange irony in that During the first few years of this campaign, 1975 through 77, the Equal Rights Amendment, which would have guaranteed equal legal rights for all American citizens regardless of gender, was ratified in 35 of the 38 required states. 
But then, of course, the whole Phyllis Schafly movement happened. Several state legislatures rescinded their ratifications, and the deadline came and went. The ERA died while a beer campaign that centered on men being men became one of the most successful of all time. In another couple of years, the United States would begin a new era of conservatism under 12 consecutive years of Reagan and Bush Sr. in the Oval Office. So maybe this is just where the culture was heading. And maybe media like the Miller Lite campaign pushed things in that direction. Regardless, it's hard to ignore or defend the campaign's political or cultural undertones. Looking back at these ads through a 21st century lens, they come off as retrograde, grotesquely retrograde in some places. What I will say, though, as an explanation, not a defense, is that the job of marketers and advertisers is not to elevate a culture. It's to make a product or brand seem appealing to its intended audience, so they're more likely to buy it. And this campaign achieved that goal extremely well, and it did it by connecting with men of a certain time in a certain context with a different, compelling, and credible message, and by holding up a mirror in which they saw their best reflection, or at least what they perceived as their ideal reflection. And it's hard to imagine that a more progressive and forward-thinking mirror would have reflected an image this audience would have recognized. All right, shifting gears. Now, one of the functional problems this campaign faced was the acting. Turns out former football players, boxers, and coaches aren't necessarily the best people to put in front of a camera. So early in the campaign, they brought in comedian Rodney Dangerfield, who was on his way to a legendary career, to do a few spots. For those who don't know, Rodney Dangerfield was the onstage persona of a comedian born Jacob Cohen, Rodney Shtick was finding himself in contexts where he was ignored or treated badly, and he'd react to this in ways that were hilarious. In an early Miller Lite spot, Rodney is lamenting that he has no luck with women, but since he started drinking light beer from Miller, women talk to him all the time. Hi. Do you come here often? Get lost. See what I mean? And then there's the classic light beer bowling tournament spot. The Taste Great team is dead even with the less filling team with one frame to go. Whose turn is it? Rodney. Every last person on his team groans as Rodney steps into the lane. The Oakland Raiders' Ben Davidson hands Rodney the ball and says, All we need is one pin, Rodney. So Rodney swings back, rolls one right down the middle, and it hits the front pin and bounces off into the gutter, at which point Rodney cowers as his teammates gather around him growling. But as much professionalism and humor as Rodney Dangerfield brought, the true start of the campaign from a certain viewpoint was the introduction of Bob Euchre. Bob Euchre, a journeyman catcher who played six years in the majors. He was a mediocre hitter, decent fielder, but he had a sharp, self-deprecating sense of humor and always exaggerated his shortcomings. After his retirement from baseball, he made a second career by creating his own onstage persona, that of the worst player to ever play the game. One example, reminiscing about how he used to catch for pitcher Phil Necro, who had a wicked knuckleball, Euchre joked that the best way to catch that pitch was to wait until it stopped rolling and then go pick it up. Now, unlike Rodney's character, which was that of a woe-is-me, self-aware loser, Euchre's version was completely oblivious. The best example of this, which led to arguably the most famous Miller Lite spot of all, was when the camera opens on Euchre in the ballpark stands, saying that the best thing about being an ex-big leaguer is getting free tickets to the game. Call the front office, he says, and bingo! But as he goes to take his seat, an usher comes by to redirect him, at which point Euchre delivers this classic line. You're in the wrong seat, buddy, come on. Oh, I must be in the front row. By the end of the spot, the camera shows Uke in the nosebleed section, yelling way down to the umps, He missed the tag! He missed the tag! This balance of professional comedians and actors, along with an ever-expanding group of pro athletes, made for the perfect balance. It felt real. It felt goofy in a good way. You never took it too seriously. And isn't that what hanging out with your friends and having a few beers is all about? And that was the handle. It wasn't just about creating a light, goofy mood or cracking you up with a joke. 
It was about making you feel like you were part of something, like you were one of the gang, like these guys were your friends, or at least that they reminded you of how much fun it was to just kick back and hang out with your friends, which is, when you think about it, the true great American pastime. More so, ironically, than baseball or football or any sport that was represented by the stars featured in those commercials. And through this campaign, Miller Lite became the unofficial beer of that great American pastime. The unofficial beer of hanging out with the guys. Now that is an incredibly powerful position to hold in the beer marketplace, which is why this is one of the greatest ad campaigns of all time. Now, let's talk numbers. Remember that this was the very same beer under two different names that fell hard on its face twice. But in the first year of the Miller Lite campaign, Miller sold 12.8 million barrels. A year later, it doubled that to 24.2 million barrels. Miller rose to second place in American beer sales on the strength of this campaign. Other brewers saw what was happening and hopped on the bandwagon fast as they could. Anheuser-Busch rolled out its own light beer, Bud Light in 1982, and backed it with a big budget campaign that featured a dog mascot named Spuds McKenzie. It was really bad. By 1992, 10 years later, light beers as a category were the best selling domestic beers in the U.S. Advertising legend Bill Birnbach once said, We are so busy measuring public opinion that we forget we can mold it. This is an important note in this age of data driven marketing. In the age where marketers are afraid to do anything if it's not validated by historical metrics or predictive analytics or generated by some magical AI platform. The only data the people at Miller Brewing had was that housewives and overweight men seemed to have no interest in diet beer. That's it. They only knew what didn't work and were challenged to come up with something that did. And they did with empathy and creativity. Empathy and creativity, two things most marketers hate to talk about because you can't measure either. You can't plot them out on spreadsheets and determine a sales trajectory. They're murky, they're messy, they're nebulous, but they're also necessary. Necessary, that is, if you have any hopes of achieving advertising greatness, because you will never create something great by citing data which, by its nature, exists in the past. Don't get me wrong, the way we've been able to leverage data over the last 15 years or so has completely transformed marketing. It's introduced science into what was once only an art. But here's a hot take, dear listener. I think we got it only half right. Somehow it became routine to use data in a backward way. We're supposed to come up with new ideas and then use data to tell us how well or not so well that idea performed. Instead, we've come to a place where we need data to grant us permission to do anything. By those rules, anything you create will only be a spin of something that worked yesterday, a watered down version of something else, like a pop song that sounds like last month's pop song or a 17th Avengers movie. We are so busy measuring public opinion that we forget we can mold it. Well, the Miller Lite campaign did just that. It grabbed a feeling that was right beneath the surface and pulled it out into the light changing the way the culture thought about light beer. It molded public opinion for its own purposes. And if that isn't the ultimate goal of advertising, what is? 